Hello everyone, hello and welcome for this new release. It's already time for Xen Orchestra 5.83 and there is again a lot to cover this month. So Oliver, I will let you let you go about all the new stuff in Xen Orchestra as usual. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a kind of a regular habit now that we have. Uh, there's many things for this uh, release and we will start uh, also, as usual, regarding uh, the backup features, um, and we started to talk about it um, last month, and that's exactly the same thing uh, for this month. We continue to make the uh, change in the naming of our backup features, but this time those changes start to be reflected inside the web UI. So again, um, there is a small, you know, uh, <clears throat> schematics to show you what changes and uh, how the name is changed exactly. Um, we added more details on the fact that uh, when you do an incremental backup, the first run is called now the key backup. Uh, and when you do uh, an incremental replication, then it's called the key replication. So we you know, used the word full before, but now we wanted to keep the word full for uh, you know, when you do a full replication or when you do a full backup. So this way it's clear there is no... you know. Uh, confusion when you are using a, a term. So that's why we, we took some time to decide about the replacement, but also to start to uh, make the actual replacement inside the web UI. So don't be surprised when you update on this uh, release to see that it's some change in the names. And now let's go directly to the core of the interesting feature we got uh, this month called the uh, mirror backup. So before talking about the mirror backup, I just want to start with an intro on two different things. The first one is now we also are in the process of changing what we call the remote, you know, the place where you store your backup. It now will be a more logically named backup repository uh, because sometimes you could have a, a you know, a, a local backup repository and it, with the old word, it means a, a local remote. With, didn't really make a lot of sense. So now we use the backup repository as opposed as the storage repository where you are storing your active VM disks. So that's a clear distinction. So we get the SR and the BR. So now we are using BR uh, instead of the remote as backup repository. Second point, um, <clears throat> before talking about those mere backup, what's interesting to understand is the fact that you could already have two backup repositories configure into one single job. That's a feature that is out since, I think, maybe two years, something like this. So it's not new at all. However, um, despite bringing some interesting features, like uh, being able to send a backup stream directly to two exact same BR at the same time, as you can see uh, uh, on the picture, um, it's entirely synchronous. So it means that all the backup uh, uh, stream that is sent directly uh, in the same time to the at exactly the same to uh, backup repositories. So the downside of doing this is if one of the BR is a lot slower than the other, since it's a stream and it's not stored anywhere, it means the backup overall speed will be at the slowest BR bandwidth available. So sometimes it's not good because you have, a, a let's say, a kind of a BR running into the same rack with 10 gig link and very fast, low latency and so on. And the second BR is to another remote site that is maybe at the other end of the country, meaning that you have a high latency, maybe a bad bandwidth. And so having a backup job that is, you know, uh, having the duration of this because of this slow or, you know, far BR is a downside. Um, the other issue is or limitation. Basically, uh, you have the same retention, same schedule, because everything is, you know, uh, a clone, if you like, in real time, in synchronous time, between the two BR. Well, we wanted something different. So that's why we are introducing the mirror backup. So in very short, uh, the mirror backup is, first you do your backup to a BR, as usual, to a backup repository. That is, again, let's use our previous example, something that is purely local, that's running inside your rack, uh, very fast, and so on. But you want also to send the content of this backup to another BR, which is on another location, maybe far away, having a poor bandwidth, whatever. And so with mirror backup, you will basically create a job that will replicate the content of your BR to another BR. And so you could tell kind of a backup of a backup, basically. But it's async. It means that you could configure 
this new BR being entirely with a dedicated retention, uh, dedicated schedule. So for example, if you have your nightly backup in your local rack, you could have this mirrored BR having a weekly backup into, I don't know, whatever S3 or slow SMB NFS, it's up to you, without, I would say, polluting the speed of your local backup. Um, and the thing is, this job is, as you can see next in the UI, basically you create a job and it's a, a mirror backup job. You select the source uh, uh, remote or BR, destination BR, and select your schedule. And that's pretty much it. So that's very, very efficient if you want to have different policies of backup, you know, one local, one uh, far away, or even archive backup. And so that's providing you that level of flexibility you couldn't have before with just having two BR at the same time. So, I mean, you could combine both if you like, uh, but anyway, that's a really good, nice improvement for the current way to do backup. We also plan on the future, so that's something that is uh, kind of improving it or refining it, is the ability to filter. Because right now you will, let's say, backup the entire uh, remote or the entire backup repository. Um, but in the future, we want to maybe only replicate or mirror uh, some VMs or through tags, for example. So if you have, a, a, let's say, let's imagine an example like an archive tag you might have on some of your VMs, only those VMs will be sent to uh, the mirror uh, BR that is in a remote place and maybe used in, I don't know, uh, a Glacier, Amazon, or, or whatever system that is meant for archiving. That's just an example. Obviously, there's many, many use cases. Uh, so feel free to experiment and, and keep us posted. So that's it for backup. But as you can see, that's a rather big feature that is really handy. Uh, now we'll switch to the cell service. Um, so let's say quickly that self-service is the ability to create a set of resources that could be used by a user to create VMs. And this user is only able to manage those VMs directly and not having access to anything else into Zen Orchestra. So it's, you know, as it said, a self-service portal to create VMs into a set of uh, predefined resources. So the first addition we made was a feedback we had during the latest uh, CloudFest uh, events where Someone asked, well, uh, that's great to create VMs for a user from the self service, but uh, I would like to combine it with your smart backup, allowing to make a backup specifically on some tags. So if you could please have tags created automatically on all those VMs created with this self service to have this tag, this way I could combine the power of your smart backup mode with the self service. And then we did it two months later. And uh, it's not a huge feature in terms of development, but that was a great idea. And that's why now you can use it to have even more automation inside your infrastructure. The other addition to the uh, self-service is regarding the, uh, the sharing or not of VMs created by the self-service. By default, when you create a VM into the self-service, you, as a user, if you have other users into the self-service, only you will be able to see it. But we've been asked that sometimes we need to share those VMs with, for example, a developer team. So we added a button to share the VM into the whole team assigned to the self-service. However, uh, it was uh, you know, an opt-in features, and sometimes people wanted that is only opt-out. So by default, having all VMs shared in the self-service. So that's why the admin can now decide to uh, switch for the opt-in to an opt-out. So is kind of sure all VMs will be shared between all the team sharing the self-service. That's it for, for the cell service. Uh, let's move on quickly uh, on the REST API stuff. Um, so basically on the REST API, uh, it's all about the updates this month. So we wanted to add the capability first that you check if there is any uh, missing patches, <clears throat> sorry, missing patches for your host. So basically you just make curl uh, or HTTP request to get, that's very simple. And you will list all the missing patches you have. So I gave an example with a, an array, a JSON array of all the, um, uh, the patches that are missing. So it's a very simple. Um, also, as usual, as we do with the, um, uh, the REST API is to make those discoverable. So if you just see the pull objects, you will see that there is a missing patches ref. And you can use that link to explore it. Um, so that's, again, a way that you 
do not require to use the web UI to have those uh, things exposed. And you can even you know, configure your monitoring system to make a call there and having a warning when there's some updates. This way, you won't uh, miss it at all. So that's uh, uh, very, very powerful. So um, still in the REST API stuff, uh, now the rolling pool updates feature is so you probably know the rolling pool update feature, but in very short, again, uh, that's a button that you click on it and it will evacuate VMs on the master, making the updates on the master, rebooting the master, getting all the VM back to the master that were moved before, and so on on all the, uh, you know, the slaves of this pool, of this cluster. Uh, and so it's fully automated, very convenient when you want to make some updates. But now it's even now possible to trigger it directly from an HTTP call. Uh, this one, uh, an HTTP posts uh, on this action. And then this will do it for you. So we can easily imagine that, I don't know, you want a web page with a single button to make that action. That's really, really easy to code right now. So you could even, you know, extend your, um, let's say, your information system with dedicated action that could be triggered outside Xenarchist right stuff. So it's still helping you to have more automation inside your system. Let's switch to the project Pergos, which is basically Kubernetes cluster creation uh, directly from the web UI of Zen Orchestra. Um, we added the capability to uh, select the number of the control planes. So basically, by default, for now, since it was still, you know, considered as a test thing, um, you would have one control plane to manage your Kubernetes cluster running into one VM. So if you lose the VM, then you lose the, you know, the ability to manage the cluster. It's basically dead. So right now, we added the capability to create more than one control plane. So basically, it's uh, one, three, five, which is in general three and five in some cases, but three is a, also a good number. Uh, basically, if you lose one of the control plane, that's not a biggie. Uh, it will be able to continue to run. So well, still moving forward and having even more interesting features uh, coming uh, for the next releases. So stay tuned on that front. Moving on, uh, let's go for the Exolite stuff. So I told you last month that um, ideally we'd have um, more features to show you this month because we spent a lot of time improving the components. By the way, um, if you want to learn more about the components and the design we're using, you should read the blog post of Clemence, our uh, UI UX designer, <clears throat> about how she's you know, um, trying to shape this future UI that is both for Exolite and Exo number six. That's really interesting if you want to get a kind of a, you know, an overview on what's going on and, and the work that we are putting into it. So uh, back on the um, Exolite stuff, so we mostly improve the consoles. So um, right now, consoles are, uh, let's say, uh, more integrated inside the UI, even if you move the UI in terms of you know extending the window, uh, moving it, and so on. So that's very, very flexible um, and also always centered and so on. So that's uh, rather you know nice to use. Uh, but also we added um, a button that is allowing you to pop up the uh, console into a different window, which is also asked, I think, for a while already. Uh, but uh, this is now possible with Exolite, which is uh, perfect if you want to just have a dedicated window of the console. So uh, there's also many other improvements. I can only suggest you to uh, make a false refresh into your existing Exolite so you could see all the improvements. Uh, so it starts to continue. Uh, to go into the right shape. Uh, it takes some time, but again, uh, we are doing things the right way uh, by using you know, a, a clear design and so on. So all the work we are also doing for Exolite is reused for Exo6. So it's not you know, time we are losing. Uh, uh, in any case, it's really important to us to, to move forward on this. OK, let's switch to the MISC section, which is, I would say, basically, uh, let's say, uh, a kind of all the improvements to the existing UI. <clears throat> so basically, uh, we started to introduce exotasks. So if you are not aware, um, in short, um, we already had Zappy tasks. So basically, the tasks coming from the hosts directly, which is handy when you make a migration and so on. But when you do Zen Orchestra operations, that could take some time, then we we must at some point rely on exo tasks so tasks that are created by Zen Orchestra itself like i don't know uh rolling pull updates 
um, backups, clearly, and things like this. So we started to introduce them for now, mostly for our uh, VMware to Vates migration system uh, directly into the UI. So this will give you more information on what's going on when there's an action, which is truly important and something we couldn't ignore to move forward with XO6. So now it starts to be visible on XO5 uh, UI, and it will be a lot better uh, in XO6 in terms of integration and so on. Another topic, uh, which is kind of funny, is uh, we somehow started to also have not just only VMware users or Hyper-V users migrating to XCP Engine Zen Orchestra, we also start to have Oracle VMs users. And Oracle VM is generating OVAs in a kind of weird, non-standard way. Uh, maybe it's not on purpose, but anyway, um, what's interesting to know is that is breaking our current way to import OVA, so we had to fix it uh, to manage this, let's say, edge case. So we, we did it, now it works. So if you are using Oracle VM, you can just export OVA and, exp and import them into Zen Orchestra, XCPNG, that will work. Uh, but that's the opportunity to quickly talk about, uh, you know, since it, VMware been acquired by Broadcom, Hyper-V free edition is being kind of phased out for the next years and so on, Red Hat having a focus on, you know, OpenShift and so on. This is leaving a kind of a gap in the virtualization market. And uh, we've been happy to share with you that uh, we, uh, Gartner, you know, uh, released a new server virtualization guide and we are inside it. And what's great about it is <laughs> they are basically telling about uh, the shift in this market since uh, all, you know all the codes, as I said, and we have been listed inside it as uh, some you know uh, uh, in the list of there's I th something like only twenty companies listed inside it. So we are inside it. So that means a lot. So feel free to read our blog posts, and if you can have uh, access to the paper through ga your Gartner subscription, uh, feel free to to take a look. So anyway, uh, that's uh, for us a kind of an honor to be there, and also kind of proof that. Uh, regarding that market, uh, it makes sense. Uh, then there is other, let's say, uh, minor, uh, let's say, updates in, in the UI. Um, the most notable thing is now if you have a host that it doesn't have HVM enabled, so it's hardware assisted visualization, uh, that is should be enabled uh, in, let's say, 1900% of the time. If it's not the case, you will have a warning visible in the host view. And we think it's important because Sometimes people had a BIOS that is uh, disabled regaining HVM for whatever reason, and they don't know why they can't boot a VM uh, on this machine. And so this way, it will be more clear uh, that was the problem. So that's it to me. Uh, feel free, Mark, to uh, uh, make your closing thoughts. Yeah, I just would like to come back a little bit on the Vites uh, blog post we did about the Gartner Server Virtualization Guide, because... Um, I would like to add that we use that opportunity to discuss also the 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 I would I would say the the roadmap outside of the technical thing for our solution for our for our company. So it's a, so for those who are interested, you can have a sneak peek of what we are planning for Vates in the larger scale in the larger picture. So that that can be an interesting reading for those interesting to, uh, inside that. Um, and finally, next week is the Xen Developer and Design Summit, which is an important date and event for us. Uh, and we will make sure to keep the, the, the community in touch of what are the next big thing that will come into Xen and probably then into XCPNU. So that, that's it for me. Um, thank you, everyone, for being there. Uh, and see you next month. See you next month. Thank you very See much. Bye-bye.